facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. Welcome to Conman's Current Events Roundtable. Today we have an exciting show with our guest, Lawrence Stern, who is an historian and lecturer. And we're going to be speaking about the major decisions of President Harry Truman. Now, Harry Truman's decisions set the course of American foreign and domestic policy for generations. They continue to shape American life today. And that is really interesting. And welcome, Larry Lawrence. I'm going to call you Lawrence, not Larry, <laughs> to the Thank show today. Thank you. And, um, I, and we're going to be talking about Harry, President Harry Truman. We've had uh, Clifton Truman Daniel, which is Margaret Truman's a son that's been on our show before, and I think that after this show, I'm going to send him uh, the DVD and um, to hear uh, what we talked about on his grandfather. And again, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to be talking about today, which is really important, we're going to be talking about the Truman Doctrine, we're going to be talking about the Marshall Plan, we're going to be talking about the atom bomb, and the U.S. recognition of the State of Israel. And before we start that, you know, Harry Truman, that's President Harry Truman, um, he got in trouble by J. Uh, Thurm, uh, Strom Thurman about having the he said, there are not enough troops in the army to force the southern people to admit the Negroes into our theaters, swimming pools, and homes. We have been stabbed in the back by a president who has betrayed every principle of the Democratic Party and his desire to win at any cost. Wow. And that sounds a little bit alike uh, what's going on uh, today. Uh, <laughs> You know, our politics of yesterday, there's a, you know, it seems like there's an overflow of politics in the same category, and we're going to get into some of that. So what do you think about that? Um, I think the most fascinating part is, is um, Strom Thurmond at the same time was having an affair with a black woman. He later had a child out of wedlock. Interesting. So it's okay to be in the bedroom, but not the swimming pool. Isn't that interesting? And, you know, um, his goal was to, what, what was his goal? What did he actually do? Didn't he have, wasn't he the first uh, president? They, they had the army. He integrated the he army. He integrated the army and also the federal government. Uh, he was very, very strong on civil rights, very strong. And going into the election of 48, he was 20 points behind in the election. And he was standing up for civil rights, and he made it a major campaign issue. Um, that I can uh, was just a major factor mm -hmm. uh, to um, that he wouldn't back away. And uh, one of his aides uh, told him that politically he'd be much smarter if he would back down, and Truman just refused to do it. Uh, it was because they said he wouldn't win, win the he presidency would win because the South. Um, the Southern Senators were going to put up a third political party, the Dixiecrats. Strom Thurmond was going to run for president. And they said, if you lose the 12 Southern states, there's no way you'll win. And so he still won yes. having those ideas and yes, principles. Strong principles. Um, I met a man named Milton Kale, who was a speechwriter for Truman. And he told me this story where one day Truman was coming into the Oval Office and he had to pass through an office that was open. There were no 
uh, particles or anything separating any. And so an aide comes up to Truman and then says to him, can I talk to you? I have something important to say. And Truman looks at his watch and he says, I'm late for a meeting. And uh, the man says, well, it'll only take a couple of minutes. So Truman says, well, can you tell me now? So the man says, okay. So the room is dead quiet. And everyone is looking around to see what this man is going to discuss with the president. And it wasn't like you were eavesdropping because it was open. And he comments to the Truman that if you back off on civil rights, you won't, you'll be able to get the Southern votes. And after you're president, then you can do whatever you want. And Kia looks at me and he puts his hand on my shoulder. And I'll never forget this. He said, Lawrence, I'm going to tell you what the president said. And I want you to remember this every single time you vote. And I'm standing there and I said, well, what did the president say? Truman's response was, I am president of all the people, which meant he was not going to back down because he felt it was the right thing to do. And if he lost the president, then he lost it. But he would not back down. He was a man of principle. Yeah, and he was also uh, that he with, uh he was a recognition of the state of Israel, too. And, you know, it was interesting because there was, and it, it was very interesting because when I knew you were going to be on my show, I did a little of my own research, and I was a little bit shocked of what I read. I was, you know, he was originally, Harry Truman was, uh, he had a partner in a store, it was a men's store in Missouri, correct? And he... Uh, and the partner was Jewish, and yet Bess Truman would not allow his partner to come into the house because he was Jewish. And Bess grew up with anti-Semitism, and here he married Bess Truman, and he was one of the best, one of our best uh, uh, presidents for Israel. And I was really shocked about that. So what happened? Why would, you know, I know you don't know why she was anti-Semitic, but, you know, he, but his, you know, people around him didn't like the blacks, and he was way, he was one of the first people to integrate our, the government, and he was also one of the first people to recognize Israel. How did that happen? And here he was married to, you know, somebody that had the things about her that didn't, you know, probably she felt the same way about the blacks as she did about the Jewish people. I think there are always people, always, who are what the times should be. When there is racial prejudice and discrimination, that is not what the times should be. When you accept other human beings for what they are and who they are, that's what we should be. And Truman was that type of man. He was the kind of president that you want because he did the right thing because it was the right thing to do. And even as a senator, he was strongly in favor of a Jewish state. And in 1941, April, uh, this was before the United States was even involved in the war, uh, Senator Elvin Barkley had asked the members of the Senate to sign a declaration favoring a Jewish state after the war. And 68 senators signed it, one of which was Truman and later Barkley become his vice president. Also in 43, I believe it was, there was a rally at the Chicago Stadium, it was called for the doomed Jews of Europe, and the Democrats were looking for a speaker, and they couldn't find anyone. And Truman heard about it and volunteered to come, which was very significant, because he used to go home all the time to visit Bess, who really spent time in Washington. And I have a copy of the speech, it's under 10 minutes, but in that speech, he calls for recognition of a Jewish state after the war. This is the, who the type of man he was, that he believed people should have freedom and democracy and have their individual rights. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, both, um, I was reading something by David Ignatius, and he was talking about Trump could learn from Harry Truman. They have a lot, there are several things that they do have in common. Both of them have daughters. You know, one was, and Truman, of course, was Margaret Truman. And in, with Trump, it's Ivanka, Tru, uh, Ivanka Trump, not Truman, but Ivanka Trump, same T. But, um, you know, uh, and, they, and they both were uh, very, to their fathers, they're there, they were there in the White House. Both of the wives were a little bit, like Best very rarely came to the White House right now. Uh, Melania hasn't really showed up that much, yet both daughters are there with their fathers and advising them, being with them, going on, visiting uh, the different leaders from, you know, all the different countries. So they do have 
something in common, the, the two presidents. Um, they also, you know, uh, about uh, what happened in North Korea, they both faced a similar challenge confronting North Korea. Truman went to war in 1950 to reverse a North Korean invasion of the South, and Trump now is close to conflict in his halt of North Korea's uh, defiant nuclear program. So there is uh, certain qualities of both of them toward North Korea. So what has happened, you know, and we were talking a little earlier at lunch today when we were, when we were at the uh, Bluegrass uh, talking about, um, you know, about the atom bomb, which is really a nuclear bomb, correct? Yes. They called it atom bomb then, now they're calling it a nuclear bomb. So, um, and I was wondering, you know, it was to me the fallout and everything, why did he use it and, you know, what was the similarity about what, North Korea, what was happening in, during that time in North Korea? Uh, well, they're completely two different situations. The dynamics were far different than they are today. Uh, North Korea at that time wanted to take over the South. And um, they were South very, Korea. Yeah, they wanted to take over South Korea. And so it was a civil war that started between the two countries. And the United States was concerned, it would be a domino effect, that if the communists would take over South Korea, they then would try to go into other countries like Vietnam, uh, at that time Burma, Indonesia, etc. And the United States and the Allies felt we should then stop them. And it was a different situation because we had allies that went to the United Nations and they voted to send troops over. So it was not just one country, it was many countries of the world that were involved. And uh, also, we were not looking to defeat the North, we just were, we were looking to have a split. And they finally, after years of war, when Eisenhower came in, they were finally able to reach a deal where they split the country in half, which became known as the 17th parallel. And today you still have the two, two separate countries. Why did, um, you know, it always concerned me, in, in 1945, um, August 6, the first atom bomb, nicknamed Little Boy, was dropped on the city of Hiroshima leveling over 60% of the city's 70,000 residents died instantaneously, instantaneously in a searing flash of heat. Three days later, on August 9th, a second bomb, which was called Fat Man, was dropped on, uh, what is it called, Nasaki? Nakasaki. Nakasaki. Over 20,000 people died um, instantly in a successive of weeks, thousands more died of the effects of radiation exposure of the blast. And, you know, we're, right now, we, you know, what, what's going, what has happened in Syria, you know, Assad, you know, turned gas and everything onto his people, and it's really been an uproar of all the countries in the world. Uh, and yet, we dropped the atom bomb and so many people died, so many people got cancer, so many people were burnt. I mean, these weren't just the soldiers that were fighting, these were the, you know, civilians. What, you know, what persuaded Harry Truman to drop and release that bomb? I think the background is important. The Japanese were losing the war, and they were losing it early on. <clears throat> Six months after the war started, the Japanese lost most of their aircraft carriers at the Battle of Midway. From that point on, it was downhill for the Japanese. When Curtis LeMay, who was in charge of the Air Force, he realized the Japanese cities were basically made out of wood. And he then asked the government to develop a firebomb. And what this was, there was a plane could drop a bomb, the plane would fly at a low level, and instead of exploding, it would start a fire. And it was in, uh, I think it was in 43 and in early 44, they started dropping these fire bombs. And as many of these cities, they destroyed 70 to 90 percent of the cities. We later learned from the Japanese, from the meetings they had after the bomb was dropped, but the meetings that they had, their record showed that 70 to 90 percent of the people got killed. One night in Tokyo, there was a raid 
whereas the Japanese had projected over 100,000 people had been killed. This was before the bomb. One, one night, 100,000 people. And the Japanese figured that 500,000 people were already dead before the first bomb was even dropped. And what is so sad about this is the sheer insanity of war and the utter stupidity of leaders who will have a country continue to fight even though hundreds of thousands of people will get killed. And then you drop the first bomb and you lose 80,000 and then you tell them if you don't surrender, they'll drop a second bomb and they continue to fight. So then you drop a second bomb and, hundreds, and then more thousands of people and then you tell them you're going to drop a third bomb and they're having a meeting to discuss this and some of the generals flatly state to the emperor that we will just fight on, we'll eat in the fields, we'll, we'll sleep, we'll eat dirt, but we'll fight on. And then the, the emperor says, how are you going to do it? And they advise him, we have a civilian defense corps of 28 million people. And the emperor was a very smart man he, in some ways. He said to him, who are these people? He wasn't even aware of it that well. And they said they are students, young people, and college students. And the emperor says, what are their armaments? And he says, bows and arrows and spears. So he says, the United States has armaments, equipment, planes, motorized vehicles. What is the tactics? And one of the generals says, we are going to have a mass charge. So he says, you're going to have a mass charge, and how many people do you think we will lose? And the general said, one million people. One he, million. He didn't care about losing well, one million Well, apparently he did not. Uh, some of these generals did not. And our generals also estimated that we would invade Japan, we would lose a million. So now you're talking about if there was an invasion. He sounds more like Kim Jong Un. Well, well, very similar the uh, qualities to him. You're man. talking about two million more people would have been killed. So by dropping the bomb, and me, many people may disagree with me on this, I think it turned out to be humanitarian because far less people got killed than the two million, even with the after effects. Hmm. Also, it helped gave people second thoughts about starting another war when you had this kind of power. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like it was the same. I think that Kim uh, Jong-un would probably, of North Korea, it sounds like he would do very much the same well, thing. There's a lot of similarities. We talked about earlier <coughs> about similarities, you know, about similarities, and this is one of the similarities that I could see uh, as far as, uh, you know, there, uh, that's going on today of what happened yesterday. And also, um, uh, I wanted to talk to you about General Douglas MacArthur. Why was he fired, so to speak, um, by you know President uh, Truman? Why was he dismissed or fired, or what, what? What did he do to deserve that? Because he was pretty active in the war. Uh, <clears throat> this was during the uh, war in. Excuse me, this was during the war in. in <clears throat> this was during the uh, Korean War. The United States was structured that the civilian controls the military and not vice versa. So the final word goes to the president, not to a general. And during the Korean War, MacArthur wanted to use atomic weapons and Truman also to expand the war into China and Truman did not want to get China involved with the millions of men that they had. And Eisenhower, I mean MacArthur, had a lot of connections with the press and also with members of Congress. And he was advising some of these people that he knew that they should tell the president and pressure him that we should use the atomic weapons that he had advocated. You cannot go over the president. You can't do it. And so Truman had no choice but to fire him. He had to do it. Interesting, because it might in my th uh, what I have down here, he wanted to drop between 30 and 50 atomic bombs on enemy bases before laying radioactive waste material across the northern edge of North Korea during the war. Now, um, you know, we probably wouldn't have had the, the problems we have today with North Korea if they probably allowed that to happen. It would have been worse because the Chinese would have entered the war. Than the United States because and the China. Chinese were the Chinese were very clear, very explicit that if it becomes too aggressive, they are going to enter the war on the side of the Koreans. 
So it would have been far worse at that time. You would have had millions of people getting killed then. Mm. So, um, so, so Lawrence, do you think that if we go into North Korea today, we'll have China on which side? Well, obviously, uh, they are their allies. Um, I'm that's not that smart to figure it out, but it would create a huge, huge problem. And um, we don't know if I, China's I, our I, ally no, 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 or China, China's their ally. Well, China is their ally because they're the right. ones that do the trade with them. But they, but most of our a lot of our hotels and our products that we buy are all from China. Well, that doesn't make any difference. If you go with if, even if China defends North Korea, that doesn't mean we're going to break off trade. Mm -hmm. I mean, one is, you talk about two different subjects. So, and, and, what, and what was happening in Russia, too? Wasn't there something with Russia? Uh, no, basically it was the, with the Chinese during the Korean War. During the Korean yeah, War, but it, prior to that. Oh, you're talking about going back to the Truman Doctrine? Yes. Okay. Um, after World War II, Stalin stated very firmly, that war was inevitable between the United States and Russia. And Truman had a cabinet meeting, and the basis of his meeting was, is there any way to defeat the Soviet Union in a military conflict and beat the Russians? And this is what I really call like thinking out of the box. And he got his personnel together. They offered suggestions, comments, and some of the documents, especially by George Kennan, some of these documents were in 20 and 30 pages. I had the opportunity to read many of them. And we had a much better understanding. They looked at, at Russia as the enemy. They looked at it philosophically, their government, their system, how it worked, how it interlocked their economy. And they came up with a plan that if we can keep the Soviet Union contained, it'll implode itself economically, and it'll take 40 years. And they said the plan will work. And in 42 years, the Soviet Union had uh, collapsed. What was the plan? Yeah, the plan was the Truman Doctrine, the Truman which basically Doctrine. was to keep the Soviet Union contained. And by the way, the first world leader to say the plan would work, uh, someone was interviewing David Ben-Gurion in Israel, who was the prime minister, and he said, uh, Truman said the plan will take 40 years. What is your opinion? And Ben-Gurion thought for about two minutes, and he looked up, he said, I think that's about right. It will work. He was the first world leader to support it. So that was the Truman Doctrine. Yeah. And it was important also when Eisenhower became president, he firmly believed in the Truman Doctrine. And being a Republican and a president, uh, it carried weight. And Churchill had a meeting with Eisenhower that he did not think it would work. And Eisenhower said, he's wrong. I'm going to continue the policy. And every single American president thereafter went forward with the policy. And, it and are, we don't need the Truman Doctrine today, or does it sound like Russia's coming up again? Uh, do you think the Truman Doctrine will peak out again, or it'll be called another doctrine, maybe? Uh, well, I always believe the brains are there. We have plenty of smart people, and it's a question of getting these smart people together who can come up with these brilliant ideas and figure out a way uh, you always have to try to plan something without war if you possibly, possibly can. War should be the absolute last resort. But you have to have the brains to do it and you have to get people together. It's just so essential to get the smart people together and think this thing out. Yeah, because you did, you did say something about that, of the type of president. Um, you said, um, which was real interesting, um, which I wrote down because I thought that was good, have to understand you, you said that you, Truman, and you applied it to him, you have to understand your enemy, not just militarily. You need to understand their philosophy and how the government operates and functions, how it, interre how it interreacts with the people, are their leaders, and are their leaders flexible? Talk a little bit about that, uh, understanding your enemy. And, uh, and you said that yeah. most of the presidents up to this day don't understand their enemy, and that's why they, get, they, they have a problem. Uh, we didn't understand our enemy. We went into uh, Vietnam. Um, I want to step back one second, and I'll go forward. 
President Franklin Roosevelt told the French when World War II ended, Vietnam should become independent and you should back away. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't listen to him. Uh, when we went into Vietnam, we didn't study history. If you would have studied history, the Chinese and the Vietnamese never liked each other. And we had a theory there would be a domino effect if Vietnam the North would take over the South. Uh, there was no justification for that, if you understand history, because the North Vietnamese were not interested in working with the Chinese. And that was our greatest fear. We didn't understand our enemy. The same thing is when we went into Iraq. We didn't understand our enemy there. We had no idea of the culture and the philosophy and the thinking that the Sunnis and the Shiites hated each other. They hated each other. So if you knocked off Saddam, the obvious thing was going to be a civil war between these two people because there was no one to keep them back. So you have to understand your enemy. And what I learned from this is not just, I want to apply it to my own personal life, that when you deal with people, you have to understand them and their side. And you'll have a better relationship with your employer, with your company, uh, even in your marriage and your children. Mm -hmm. And you just, you have to know the other side and how they think and how they're going to react and things will work better. You just don't go in and say, I'm going to do it. Society doesn't accept that. Yeah, because each country has their own ways of doing things. You can't just say that all country, everything's the same. All the enemies are the same. All the leaders are the same. All the, you know, you have to, each one is individual and people have to see it as an individual basis. Lawrence, how did you get, how did Truman become important to you? You seem to really, um, I've attended your lectures on Truman, and I know that you also have a, um, you know, a DVD on Truman. And how did you get active in this? You know, why has he become your, I would think, one of your favorite presidents? Um, I, I like Truman's philosophy on so many things. He was an extremely moral person, very ethical. He had the ability to think out of the box. Uh, he knew to work with allies. And he was a reader. And if you want to understand things, you have to read. And all our great presidents have been readers. And so I learned a lot from Truman, which I applied to my personal life. So reading presidents. Uh, nowadays, our presidents uh, get their advice from uh, television and uh, you know, people aren't reading as much these days because TV is around and pretty soon that will be all replaced with uh, their iPhones and uh, electronic equipment. Books are on their, you know, hopefully not on their way out, but a lot of people don't read. And you're, what you're saying, most of our really good presidents were good readers. And they studied up on their their history, the history of their country, of different countries, their own country, and they were more involved. Um, we only have a few minutes more. So can you talk a little bit about the Marshall? Oh, we have one minute more. I don't think oh. we'll have, be able, you could say in one sentence, what was the Marshall Plan? The Marshall Plan basically was to rebuild Western Europe. And it really was a component part of the Truman Doctrine. It was a brilliant plan. Very good, and it worked. And it was it really, worked. and what you were saying, it was really the Truman plan, but they, they, but Truman didn't want to put his name on it. Well, he felt that the Republicans wouldn't vote for it. They liked Marshall. <laughs> if he called the Marshall plan, it would pass. So well, fortunately, he did not have an ego. Anyway, I want to thank you, Lawrence, uh, for your knowledge and for your um, insightfulness, and you're a great historian and lecturer. Uh, you know, the next president that you do will have you on the show again. So to inform the viewers a little bit more about major decisions of president, uh, of the different presidents, and we did do the major de decisions of our president, Harry Truman. Again, thank you very much, thank you for Claire, having me. Lawrence, for thank coming. You. I appreciate it. And, um, you know.